Grace and peace in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'd like to begin talking about forgiveness this morning by telling a little bit about the story of a woman named Fannie Lou Hamer. Does anyone recognize that name? A couple people. Phil raised his hand at the 745 service and was like, wow, he didn't raise his hand last night. He must have, you know, gone to research and then I realized he was just hearing the sermon again. <laughs> it is a real shame that not more people know about her because she is one of the true heroes of our country and of the civil rights movement. Fannie Lou Hamer was born on October 6, 1917 in rural Mississippi. And by age six, she was picking cotton in the field with her parents, who were both sharecroppers. Being a, a sharecropper meant that the family didn't own the land they worked, but had an agreement with a, with a white landowner where they'd have to turn over 30 to 50 percent of the crops as payment to use the field. And landowners frequently abused this system to keep their sharecroppers perpetually in debt to them. Fannie Lou Hamer attended a one-room school on the plantation her family lived on from ages 7 to 13 and then had to drop out to work full-time. In 1945, at the age of 28, she married her husband and they worked together on the same plantation for 18 years. In the 1960s, as the civil rights movement began to grow, Fannie Lou Hamer decided that she wanted to register to vote. The first time she tried, she was given a literacy test. But when she was able to fluently read the Mississippi State Constitution, she was then told that she also had to give learned opinions about many of the legal issues within it, and then rejected. When she went back six months later, which was the soonest she could try again, she passed that part of the test as well. That same day, the, her employer, the plantation owner, fired her for registering to vote. Soon after, she was arrested without charges and then restrained and beaten while in custody until she was almost dead. But Fannie Lou Hamer came back from this to become a civil rights leader on a national scale. She was famous for leading protesters in song, like This Little Light of Mine, to emphasize the spirituality of the movement. And she, almost, she also became famous for her testimony about her trials and tribulations of registering to vote. When you think about forgiveness in the life of Fannie Lou Hamer, it just doesn't quite add up. How could we be supposed to forgive people who almost beat us to death? How could you ask someone to forgive others for holding their family ransom through the sharecropping system? How could you forgive someone for firing you just because you registered to vote? These examples point to the bigger issue of forgiveness in our world. Forgiveness just doesn't make sense. Forgiveness can't cancel out the words that were used to hurt us. Forgiveness can't bring someone back after they've been killed. Forgiveness isn't a magic thing that helps us feel better when we've been bullied. And forgiveness doesn't make that unfair boss any more fair. And in general, forgiveness doesn't make sense because it can never right the original wrong or heal the hurt that was experienced. If I'm making forgiveness sound small and unimportant, that's because a view of forgiveness from the outside, from afar, will never do it justice. Forgiveness just in the eyes of the world will never add up. In our scripture reading today, the Apostle Paul is writing to the early Christian church in Corinth, and while well, it's not a very happy letter, in fact, there's been a conflict in the community, and it seems there are a lot of people hurt by it, including Paul himself. Here's what he writes. 
So I made up my mind not to make you another painful visit. For if I cause you pain, who is there to make me glad but the one I have pained? These verses tell of a a visit Paul made to the community that apparently didn't go very well. And in response to it, Paul wrote a letter back, sometimes called the Letter of Tears. He continues, And I wrote as I did so that when I came, I might not suffer pain from those who should have made me rejoice. For I am confident about all of you, that my joy would be the joy of all of you. For I wrote you out of much distress and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love that I have for you. It is this tension, love in the midst of tears and anguish that the Apostle Paul uses to transition from talking about pain to talking about forgiveness. But if anyone has caused pain, he has caused it not to me, but to some extent, not to exaggerate, to all of you. This punishment by the majority is enough for such a person. So now instead you should forgive and console him, so that he may not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I urge you to reaffirm your love for him. Paul never explains what exactly happened. But from the fact that he talks about this visit in painful terms and wrote the the letter of tears, I think it's fair to assume that what happened was serious. This still leaves us with the question, though, today, of how forgiveness can matter in a world in which so many people have been wounded, in which there are so many stories, like those of Fannie Lou Hamer, of people who have endured things that should be more or less unforgivable. The question of forgiveness doesn't make sense because there's no way to magically fix the suffering that people endure in the world. And that leads us directly to the question of evil. If God is so good, why does so much bad stuff happen? Once I figure that out, I will be sure to tell you right after I turn in the manuscript for my best-selling book. In the meantime, while we wait for the wonderful revelation of all the mysteries of God, we still have to keep living, right? Here's what Helmut Thielicke, a German Lutheran pastor during World War II, had to say about forgiveness. Forgiveness provides the sole possibility of the world ever escaping the law of the echo. He continues, We are always echoes. The only question is echoes of what? Either we are echoes of the injustice, the meanness that is around us, and then we ourselves become scheming and cheating and mean, or we are echoes of Jesus Christ. And therefore, echoes of that forgiving, renewing, creative love that comes to us from God. And then we ourselves become loving, renewing, forgiving, creative, and positive. What Tilika says in that paragraph gets to the heart of this whole dilemma about evil and forgiveness. While we're living, we have a choice about what values we want to reflect and embody. And either... We can let ourselves get sucked along with all the other water draining out of the tub. Or we can make a conscious effort to go against the stream and echo the life of Jesus Christ, bringing forgiveness and healing and truth-telling wherever we go. And while we could make this complicated and worry about lots of doctrine and rules, I think For us, it really boils down to one thing. Are the people you're spending your time with the kind of people who echo forgiveness, or do they echo something else? Father Richard Rohr, a Franciscan priest, says this, we need to meet people whose faith, patience, and forgiveness tell us that we are still in the kindergarten of love. We need to be influenced by people who are happy without having all the things we think are essential to happiness. 
Once we know that the things we often think are essential to happiness are in fact not essential, then we can help ourselves be free to echo the people whose spiritual depth, whose love for God and for other people makes ripples and waves in the world around them. And the easiest way to help ourselves create an attitude of forgiveness is choosing who we spend our time around. One famous personal trainer put it this way. In an interview about training the Packers running back Eddie Lacy this offseason, Tony Horton said that if you're hanging out with a bunch of dudes who sit on the couch and eat pizza, that's what you're going to become. And I think that's true spiritually as well. I experienced the truth of this last week. When I spent a week with Pastor Gloria, our partner church's pastor from El Salvador, who definitely made me feel like I'm in the kindergarten of love. Here's one story. For six years, she worked with the mayor of her city, to create opportunities for youth to have education and safe places to be after school. For six years, she worked with this mayor who was a member of the political party who tortured her brother, also a Lutheran pastor during the Salvadoran Civil War. This should make all of us pause and think about even the little ways we struggle to show love to people in our families, our coworkers, or our friends. So if you want to work on being a more forgiving person, like Paul tells us we should be, the first step is to make sure the people you're surrounding yourself with are forgiving people. And if you want to see our world become a more forgiving place, even in the midst of suffering of people like Fannie Lou Hamer and our friends in El Salvador, we need to take the Apostle Paul's commandment seriously that instead of punishment, we should seek to forgive others. And so my invitation to you this week is to sit down and figure out who in your life makes you feel like you're still in the kindergarten of love. Who inspires you? Who lifts up the people around them? Who is the clearest echo of the love and forgiveness of Jesus Christ that you know? And once you figure that out, it's simple. Make a plan for how you're going to spend time with them and who you want to be around so that you can always remember that we are able to forgive because God first and always forgives us. Amen.